I need the help of experts to put forth this bill. My motivation came from an experience that I went through with my wife. And you will hear something later today from someone who's here to speak on behalf of this bill, the author, Mr. Dan Walter, who wrote Collateral Damages. On the back of the book it reads, from his introduction, as to why he wrote this book. My larger purpose in writing this book is to tell Pam, whom is his wife, that she does matter and that her life is important and her story is important and it deserves to be honestly told. What's up, um, Good afternoon. I'm Matthew Milling Downing. I reside in Laytonsville, Maryland, and I'm present today because I am very much in support of House Bill 821, the Medical Harm Disclosure Act. I have a story that I want to share with you. Um, on Sunday, January 4th of 2004, I took my daughter to a hospital at the suggestion of poison control and her pediatrician because she started exhibiting signs of agitation and hand tremors following an ingestion of one pill too many. Um, she had been told by her doctor that she could take um, an antidepressant which had been prescribed for test anxiety at school, and that if she was anxious about school to go ahead and take one at night. The agitation was such that I was concerned, and poison control did feel it was necessary for me to take her to the hospital. Within 15 minutes of being at the hospital, she had vomited the one pill, but she was taken into the pediatric ER for monitoring. Rather than just monitor her, she was given a sedative. This was given to her intravenously, and she immediately reacted in an adverse way. Her body began jerking, and she began hallucinating immediately. Her heart rate started rising, as well as her pulse. Then she began running a fever. When I questioned the doctor, I was informed, well, maybe this sedative didn't work, but we have a lot of others we can try. At that point, they injected her with a second sedative. At this point, the hallucinations got much worse and became very violent. Her temperature continued to rise. Her heart rate continued to go up. When I asked the doctor at that point, what are you doing to my daughter? Her response was, I have no idea. I'm calling poison control. What should have been nothing more than a short monitoring period in a hospital ER became 13 hours in the ER, followed by four days in the pediatric intensive care unit. When she was taken to the PICU, they actually had a sitter be with her because her, her vital signs needed to be monitored all the time. She stopped eating, she stopped sleeping, and she, the hallucinations continued around the clock. When my husband asked one of the PICU's daughters, PICU doctors what was happening, the response was, we have no idea, we're out of our league on this one. But at no time did they ever consider transporting her to another hospital where maybe they would know how to give my daughter adequate care. On the third day of her hospital stay, still in the PICU, she was given a medication for severe headache. I didn't recognize the medication. When I asked what it was, they told me it was Tylenol. I learned, out, learned much later it was not Tylenol. They, at that point, had given her four times the amount of the prescription medication that had brought her to the hospital. After four days, my daughter was released. Um, having been interviewed by an adult psychiatrist, I should tell you at this time, my daughter was 12 years old and 67 pounds. The injections they gave her were not only given incorrectly, they were given in adult portions, rather than taking into account her age or her size. She came home still lethargic, listless, still not eating, not sleeping, and continuing with hallucinations. At no time did anyone in this hospital ever speak to me about what had transpired to place her in this tailspin. 
No one explained the psychosis to me that she was going through, and there were no warning signs given about her care after we left. I have to tell you that three days after my daughter came home, she went up to her bedroom and she hanged herself. This is a 12-year-old child with no history at all, none, of suicidality or suicidal tendencies or depression. Her death was a total shock, and it brought us unbearable emotional pain and suffering. I have so many unanswered questions. It's been over seven years. The pain is still there. The list of hospital errors in this case is long. There was no check at the hospital of contraindications and medications. Sedatives cannot be taken in the way they were administered to my daughter with antidepressants. Her weight was not taken into consideration. Her weight was not, her weight her height, her age, nothing was taken into consideration. I also did learn that what they told me was Tylenol, as I said, was the same antidepressant she'd gone in the hospital for. I know this was true, that that's what they gave her because we didn't have an autopsy performed upon her death and found that her body was full of that antidepressant. This is not an insulated, an isolated incident not for this hospital and not other hospitals. I received a hospital bill of just over $14,000 with no explanation. I, I'm, I'm just sick about this whole thing. We had the right to assume that the doctors knew what they were doing and understood the reactions of medications and contraindications, much less that they would know what the appropriate doses were to be given to a child. My daughter might not have died in this hospital, but her death was a direct correlation to the poor level of care she received while there. It is imperative that this bill be passed so that future patients may be treated with less neglect, more dignity, and a higher standard of care. Reports of hospital error must become mandatory as voluntary reporting is virtually non-existent. Summaries of hospitals' level of care must be made public and available to everyone so that a patient's expectations can be realistic and honest. Reporting would mandate higher standards of care and support the Hippocratic Oath. Guidelines would identify medical harm and offer consistent measures between all hospitals and facilities. Penalties would prevent hospitals from becoming so insensitive to patients' needs and would offer a greater degree of inspection of those facilities. Please, I beg you, support the measures so that less patients will be harmed or killed in the future. Patients deserve better and their families deserve better too. Bring back ethics to hospital care. Thank you. Well, I saw one uh, summation here of this bill. It says that the state has a compelling and urgent need to require hospitals to account for medical harm to patients and to issue public reports uh, regarding the number of incidents and the type of harm that occur at each hospital. And I would add that this state and this committee has a responsibility to do that. That is your job. Because who's running the system now is our corporations. And I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with uh, lobbyists from pharmaceutical companies, device manufacturers, hospital corporations. I'm sure you're getting pressured and pushed from all sides. This woman here and myself are just regular people. And you are supposed to be our voice. You are supposed to be doing this for us. And we shouldn't be having to go through this stuff. It's because people here, you know, I, I really applaud uh, Michael Summers here because he's one who's speaking truth to power. He's saying this isn't right. And it's, maybe it's going to cost you, maybe it's going to inconvenience you. But we want transparency, accountability. And that's not too much to ask when your life is on the line. Because I know uh, almost everybody I talk to, when I tell them about what happened to my wife, they say, oh, yeah, my, I had my uncle did, or my, my cousin, or my brother, or my sister, they went in there. There is a crisis of patient safety. And something's got to be done, and it's your job to do it. You know, and if these guys, the lobbyists, are going to say, no, you can't do that. It costs too much money, you know. You, you know, you have to stand up and do your job. And what happened, but my wife was a nurse, and 
The way I met her was my dad was sick in Florida, and he was in the hospital because of a staph infection that he had picked up from a different hospital previously, and nobody told him about it, ever. And the only way I found out is that I wound up marrying his nurse. And she told me all the things that went on behind the scenes. The doctors weren't going to tell me. Nobody. And I found out that's what happened, and my father died. So I come up. We come up and move here to Annapolis. My wife worked at Anne Arundel Medical Center. She had, uh, for a while, she had arrhythmia. I took her up to Johns Hopkins. They say, we have, a new, we have a procedure here. It's fairly new, but we've done tons of them. We've never had any problems here. Uh, the message to us was this is a pretty well-vetted procedure, and you're safe in my hands. The head of the EP lab told us that. He was going to do the job. He's the best in the country. This is the best hospital in America. And what happened was they let a trainee do the job, and they got the – this was a catheter that they snaked up into her heart, and I got caught in the mitral valve muscles of her heart. And, and it was a new instrument. It was an investigative procedure, an investigative instrument, and a trainee. And they couldn't get that wire out of the, out of the mitral valve muscles. So finally they called somebody in, and he just rolled the dice, and he yanked it, and he ripped out her mitral valve muscles. And they continued with the ablation procedure because, little did we know, there was a study in progress. And they wanted to have her on the books as having a completed ablation procedure so that they could say, well, here is a, a successful procedure. And the doc comes out after, shortly afterwards and he says to me, well, you know, I'm sorry, I turned my back and uh, the, the catheter got lost and that's how I got in the mitral valve. It was my fault. You know, because at that point, we didn't know a trainee was doing the job. And they didn't find out until four years later when they let it accidentally slip. And they parceled out the records, you know, 10 pages here, 20 pages there. And they lied and they fought and they obfuscated every inch of the way. And one of the ways that this bill would have helped is that this doctor told us, this procedure, I've done lots of them here and there's never been any problems here, no injuries, you know. That was a lie. You know, and if there was a, a, a place where I could just look, instead of pawing through medical journals and things like that, if I could just look and say, well, they've done 40 of these and there have been 12, 12 com complications, quote unquote complications, and that covers a lot of sins. You know, a lot of times, you know, your family's out there in the, in the waiting room and the doc will come out and say, oh, well, sorry, the complication came up, you didn't make it. And you go, well, thanks, doc. I know you did the best you could. What you didn't know is that maybe there was a pharmaceutical rep in there or a device rep in there, and they were trying something different or something broke or, you know. Their first reflex and reaction is to lie and stonewall. And they've got the money and they've got the power and they've got everybody believing in the infallibility of medicine and nobody wants to question their doctor and nobody wants to believe the system is corrupt. And, you know, there's this there, – right now there's a there's – a, epidemic of infections in hospitals, MRSA, diff, and all kinds of flesh-eating horrible things. It, it, hospitals are dangerous places to be. And I say, and I, there's an old saying that sunshine is the best disinfectant all around. And, and that's what you guys need to be doing here. Shed some light. That's all this is. Everybody else, every other business, you're held accountable for your mistakes and your errors. And for some reason, medicine, they get a pass on things. So I, I applaud Delegate Summers so that, that things that happen with, with this woman and, and, and my wife, don't, they don't have to happen. It's unnecessary. And the cost, my wife, that procedure was supposed to cost 1500 bucks or something like that. And it wound up, she's disabled, she's on Medicare for the rest of her life, and the, we got a bill from the hospital for $120,000. You know, you're not saving money here. So I think you should do the right thing and push this bill through. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions of this panel? Thank you very much for your time and your testimony here today.